All right, we can go ahead and get started. Okay. Well, welcome to Destination UMW, everyone. We are so happy that you are here. My name is Dr. Melissa Jenkins, and I'm co-teaching today with Dr. Kevin Good. We want to start by letting you know that the session is being recorded so that others may have a chance to view it later. So that means if you are not comfortable being seen on the recording, please feel free to leave your cameras off, which I see many of you have already done. And also, if you are not comfortable having your voice recorded, you may respond to any questions that we pose or ask questions of us using the chat box, although we certainly do welcome you to um, participate verbally or turn your cameras on, whatever makes you comfortable today. So I'm going to go ahead and get started by sharing my screen. And let's see here. Share. And we are going to dive right in to a topic that is near and dear to our hearts in the College of Education. And that is the uh, concept of how we ensure that we are educators for all students. And as part of that discussion, we are going to really look at um, what it means to teach all students and how this idea of fair and equal are not necessarily synonyms in education. So for this session, you will need some kind of writing utensil and something to write with. It really is just for you to um, take notes for yourself or jot down little ideas. We're not going to obviously ask you to turn anything in or collect anything. We're also going to use this Jamboard link at the end, which I will post in the chat box when it's time to do that. The only other thing that I'm going to ask of you, um, something that you will need, is kind of a participatory mindset. I know it's a little bit strange to be in a class, so to speak, with a bunch of people you don't know and professors you don't know, but we really want to give you the true College of Education experience of what um, our instruction looks like. And we, as professors in the College of Education, value you as learners and the experiences that you've had in your K through 12 education and realize that you bring a lot of experiences to the table that can help us in these discussions related to education. So today we're going to invite you to share some experiences or observations or opinions, and we hope that you will do that. Um, know that we're not going to ask you any questions where you could even possibly have a wrong answer. So be confident in sharing your experiences. We, we definitely hope you'll do that. So to get started, break out that pencil or pen or whatever you have handy. And we are assuming that if you're here with us today that you have some interest in becoming a teacher. So I'd like you just to take a second and make a quick notation to yourself. Use a sentence, a phrase, sketch an image that just touches on the concept of why you might be interested in becoming a teacher. Now, as we go through the next sections of our presentation, you're going to learn a little bit more about why Dr. Good and I um, our teachers are interested in teaching and some of the experiences that we've had that might motivate you um, in terms of becoming a teacher. So let's start with a little bit about us. So as I said, my name is Dr. Melissa Jenkins. I am an assistant professor of special education here at the University of Mary Washington. I've been here for about a year and a half. I um, love special education and everything about teaching special education and preparing future teachers to become special educators, but also preparing future general education teachers to work with diverse student populations. My interest in special education started at a very young age. I was raised in Southern California in my early kindergarten, first grade, second grade years. I was in inclusive settings where students with disabilities were present as a regular part of my day. And honestly, I didn't know that that was unusual. Um, it turns out that at the time, which is sometime in the 70s, that was pretty unusual. Um, 
but it really just established an experience for me where understanding that people are diverse and learning differences are present all around us was very common. When I was about seven years old, I read that book that you can see there, The Value of Determination, which is a story of Helen Keller. And I decided at seven that I would be a special education teacher. And everything that I've done in my career has been related to that ever since. So I went um, to George Mason University here in Virginia to earn my undergraduate degree in psychology, then on to Old Dominion where I earned my master's degree in special education, and then back to George Mason to earn my doctorate, which is what now brings me here to have an opportunity to work with all of you. Throughout those years where I was developing my, my education and my skills, I also um, was a special education teacher for 15 years in Virginia's public schools. And I primarily worked with elementary age students, um, but I spent about three years at the high school level as an instructional coach, and then also had an opportunity to be a, an administrator for special education in central office in the second largest school division in Virginia. So what that means is when I am working with students here in the College of Education, I have that traditional academic background in terms of book learning and research and all of that to share with you. But I also focus very intensively on what it means to actually apply those um, theories and knowledge and activities into real classroom experiences. And I'm looking forward to sharing that with you today. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Good to allow him to introduce himself. So good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Kevin Good. Uh, I grew up here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, um, went to Oklahoma for my undergraduate, came back to Virginia uh, after that, my, um, and had the chance to be involved in education here in the Commonwealth. Uh, I wound up teaching in a rural district here in Virginia, uh, my home county. Uh, so I kind of left and came back home to teach, uh, which is a really great experience when you can do that uh, and give back to your community because it feels like it comes full circle. Uh, at that point, the teachers who poured into you, now you're getting to pour back into those, those students. And it's really an interesting experience when you get to see your teachers as your colleagues now, um, which is a very fun experience. Uh, I did, uh, Browns as a, um, um, a coach for a student, uh, as well as going through and, and becoming a teacher. Uh, primarily spent most of my time in the elementary classroom setting, but I've also had experience at middle and high school levels as well. It's the nature of being a, a Virginia special educator. We're licensed for K-12 education, uh, so we bop around sometimes. Uh, but we, the, we do it all. <laughs> we do it all, and we teach it all. <laughs> <laughs> um, my academic background, I started out first thinking I was going to be I go into more of the medical side of things, and so I've had biology and chemistry and physics and all kinds of courses, which has really helped me. So that's the value of a liberal arts education, that it really helps us in special education be powerful educators because we understand subjects from multiple uh, levels and multiple perspectives. So if we're asked to step into a chemistry classroom to support a student, we understand what they're talking about. Uh, and we're not going, um, okay, <laughs> uh, which is a really nice benefit. Two of the pictures that appear on the screen are from my uh, classroom, my last year of teaching. Uh, brings back good memories every time I see them. That's why I always put it there. Uh, but really became inspired to be a teacher in second grade uh, when I had some really awesome teachers who supported me uh, in my educational journey and really just inspired me of what does it mean to be that extra teacher, uh, to go above and beyond and to give that extra time um, because we all struggle with things at times. It's what I always tell students. Uh, so even when you're going through a hard class, we all struggle with things at certain times. Uh, and I had teachers who really invested in me, some of the early RTI before RTI existed. Uh, and so um, that's when I got inspired to do education. Spent most of my career in autism and EBD as well. So if you're interested in those things, uh, you have professionals here who are interested in those things as well. Absolutely. And I will add that even though Dr. Good and I are both um, focused on special education, we certainly don't expect that all of you or even most of you are focused on special education. And we're not going to only talk about special education today, even though that is our love and our passion. So true. <laughs> all right. So we would like to take a 
a moment to let you all introduce yourself using the chat box. With the number of you that are here, we just didn't feel it would be either effective or maybe comfortable for everyone to introduce yourself um, on screen or verbally. So we would like to invite you to just type your name into the chat box, tell us where you're from. And if you know that you have a specific interest um, in a grade level or subject area of education, go ahead and type that in. That just gives us a sense of who is here and what maybe we can start to discuss or focus on. There, they're coming in. We've got some out of staters here. Awesome, welcome. And some local. Looks like some elementary and high school. First and second. History, very, very nice. We've got some small town people here and some from larger areas of Virginia. That's awesome. Well, wherever you're from, whatever you're interested in learning about, we are certainly glad that you are here. Go ahead and keep typing as we move forward and, and Dr. Good and I will peek in on those chat boxes as we go through. Oh, okay. Dr. Good, you wanna take it from here? So I think one of the best things about education is you will have a reason to smile every day. Students are gonna give you that inspiration every day. And I think that's what keeps us moving forward. Um, I took the picture of the minions because I have students who just loved them and every day it was some kind of minion reference and you'll learn to be the most creative person to work student interest into your classrooms. Um, and it's always a fun experience and it also inspires you to do more and to be more uh, as a teacher uh, and, and that's the picture in the right uh, bottom hand screen. Uh, I've worked with some college students and we've worked with some elementary students who were struggling with uh, verbal communication. Uh, and we problem solved and came up with a communication device that was uh, 3D printed uh, because the student was visually impaired and couldn't see their communication board. Uh, and so we figured out a way to help them be able to communicate with those around them. And I think that's the exciting thing about being a teacher is you, you're inspired. So it's not, it's, it's, it's this wonderful two-way street. You're inspiring students to learn, but you're also being inspired every day by them. Um, and you'll walk out the door usually with some funny story that happened throughout your day um, that made it all worth it at the end of the day and all the lesson planning uh, and, and the things that you did made it worth it. Uh, and there, students are always great to be around. You're gonna have your challenges, um, but at the end of the day, you're gonna smile and say, I helped that student learn to read or I helped that student conquer that chemistry equation um, or I helped them learn some history uh, that's going to impact them for the rest of their lives. And I think that's one of the most exciting things is did you walk away every day with a smile. Absolutely. I am just curious if any of you, as you wrote your little why teach, if you had something about it would make you happy or that idea of um, giving students something that would make you smile. Can you use the thumbs up signal on your, on your um, Zoom features to let us know? Awesome. So some of you, some, this resonates with some of you. Very nice. All right, let's look at the next reason. Dr. Good, you want to talk about this one? Um, you also, yeah, I can, most certainly can. <laughs> you also have the opportunity to show young students that learning is fun. Um, so if you see, this is actually me dressed up as a Jedi. Um, because we were talking about how you could conquer things. And it was during the time when Star Wars was everywhere. <laughs> um, so it was a great way to engage the students and help them think outside of the box. Um, it was also a part of a challenge to students to be more involved. And so um, you have the opportunity to start to think outside of the box as well as a teacher uh, and really get down there. I always like to say you roll up your sleeves and you learn who your students are. 
Uh, Rita Pearson would often say it's all about relationships. And that's mm -hmm. one of the biggest things in education is we have to start from relationship. We will teach you theory and practice and how to be a teacher, but you have to also remember it's about relationships and learning to build relationships with your students. Um, and they're professional relationships, but you have to learn how to, to joke and cut up uh, in professional ways. It helps inspire students that learning is fun. There's a reason to come to school. Uh, one of the, the worst things that you can ever hear as a teacher is, I don't want to come to school um, because it should be a place you want to come to every day. Uh, and it's part of our job to figure out a way to help students find that love of learning. Uh, and so if we can inspire that by doing silly things, um, it's, it's all the more fun on our side because it's also fun to be a little silly sometimes um, and it inspires learning. Absolutely. And I will add that as a teacher, it's one of the few careers where you will likely have pajama day on a regular basis so that, that, that is but, the best ever <laughs> i agree that is sometimes part of the fun there are so many opportunities for us um, to engage with students to show them that even difficult content can be fun and meaningful and engaging for all students. So if this um, resonated with you as something that you wrote, or even if you just agree, this sounds like a great reason to be a teacher, we'd love to see some of those thumbs up again. There it is, awesome. Okay. So this is one of my favorite things about teaching. Um, as a teacher, we have the opportunity to help students really find out who they are, what they're good at, to recognize their strengths. Um, as special educators, especially um, Dr. Good and I probably both share the experience of having worked with students who were just always frustrated by school, who felt like school was so challenging and didn't always see their strengths. Um, or sometimes they were working and engaging with community members and family members who didn't see their strengths. So one of the amazing opportunities that we have as educators, whether special education or not, is to help students recognize that they can do so many things and that they can be proud of themselves. Um, these two pictures really resonate deeply with me. The little girl on the left um, came to me as a five-year-old. She was nonverbal. There was there was really not a lot of expectation that she would be speaking or engaging in academic skills in her first year with me. And let me tell you something, this little girl talks now. <laughs> and within that first year, she could say all kinds of things and express her opinions. And she was so proud and confident um, in herself. And the sign there, actually it's relevant right now, tomorrow is Down Syndrome Awareness Day. Um, this child and her family celebrate Down Syndrome Awareness Day and all that is possible for individuals with Down Syndrome. And she almost celebrates that day like it's her birthday. So it was awesome to kind of experience that with a learner. Um, the picture of the little boy with the dog uh, in my classroom, we often had the um, therapy dogs or support dogs come in and engage with students to help them work through skills that were challenging and find out that they could do things. And it was just an amazing experience to be able to have kids have these really positive moments to see that they could do things and be proud. So if that idea of helping students recognizes their strengths resonates with you, let's see some thumbs up here. Awesome, great. Beautiful, thank you. All right, the other thing um, that I think rings so true with so many of us is that as teachers, we have such an opportunity to make a difference in the lives of students. Again, these are some of my former students who are now adults. I taught both of these young people when they are in third grade and I am still in contact with them today. Um, when I taught them as third graders, they were both dealing with a lot of things that just made school difficult and frustrating and hard. And we worked through it together. And obviously we built some really positive relationships since I'm still hearing from them. 
But both of them have gone on to be successful, to be confident, to be individuals who give back to their communities. And I'm so proud of that for them and so proud to have been a part of, the, of them learning about themselves and having an opportunity to make a difference. So if any of you said something about making a difference, let's see if we have some thumbs up for that. Yeah. Very nice. I feel like that idea of making a difference resonates for a lot of educators. So I'm wondering, as we think about the concept of making a difference, if you're thinking, I want to make a difference for some kids. I want to you know, support a certain group of students, but I'm not really concerned about everyone. Or if you're thinking it's about making a difference for all kids. So that really is our focus for today, making a difference for all kids, because I'm pretty confident that none of you just said, I hope I can make a difference for the kids that school is easy for, or I hope I can make a difference only for the kids who are just like me. Dr. Good, is there anything you wanna to add to that? And I'm hoping that it's a, that you're thinking um, that that means that all students can learn uh, and that we can figure out ways to help them learn. In terms of objectives, what are we hoping you're going to get out of today, right? A good lesson always starts with some planning. Uh, and so we want to share some of our thoughts with you. What we want you to know is uh, barriers to quality education. Uh, and thinking about those barriers, uh, we're hoping that you're going to come away with uh, some knowledge on definitions of uh, equality and equity and accessibility. We're hoping that you'll understand uh, by the time that we finish this time together is that universal design for learning is a framework that supports accessibility for all. Uh, and then by the end of this, we're all going to engage in some stuff uh, and that we're gonna compare and contrast uh, the concepts of equity, equality, and accessibility, and also how to describe UDL supports and inclusion for all. So that's kind of the layout of the land for today. So this is where I'm going to ask for some participation from all of you. I know that all of you have had different experiences in education, whether it's big schools, small schools, rural, urban, private schools, home schools, you have backgrounds in education. So I'm wondering either by verbal response or by chat, what are some things that you have seen as barriers that prevent all learners from having the same quality of education or the same experience in education? If you want to type something in, go ahead and just type it into the chat. If you would like to share something out loud, feel free to just unmute your microphone and say something. I see good resources, access to resources coming in, learning disabilities, social skills, yes, mental health, income that relates to access to resources, funding, absolutely. Teachers who don't have training for learning differences, yep. Different ways that students learn, language, socioeconomic status. You guys are rock stars, awesome job. Um, all of these, absolutely support at home, disabilities. Wonderful, thank you. Yes, these are all potential barriers to education. You have, you have hit all of the key ones right on the head. So let me start by telling you that um, in our legal system, the first attempt to begin to address some of those barriers was to say, that all students were expected to have equal access or opportunity to be physically present in schools. So around the 1950s, each state started establishing laws that said all students under the age of 18 were expected to attend school. But unfortunately at that time, it didn't really mean all students. They said all students, but we know that, you know, in 
it wasn't until 1960s that we had true integration of um, racial integration. And then it wasn't until 1975 that students with disabilities were required to be allowed to attend schools. So initially the idea of eliminating barriers was this idea of equality. All students get physical access. And within that, they get potentially, if we're doing this right in this time, they get the same instruction and same support regardless of whatever their individual characteristics or background might be. So this image on the right kind of demonstrates or represents some concepts that we think about related to equality in education. And I'm wondering what you see in terms of how does this idea of equality represent fairness? Does this seem like a fair education if we're thinking about this baseball game as a metaphor for education? Does this look fair? Feel free to type some things in the chat box. You can type fair or not fair, or you could type what makes it look fair or not fair. Thank you, Claire, talking about not addressing the needs of each student. Yep, some not fairs popping into the box. The same playing field, but not equal based on everyone's abilities. Beautiful. Nicole, not everyone learns in the same way. Absolutely, good. And a lot of you are, are using that word equity, which kind of leads us now into the next image that we have. So if we look now, the image on the left is that idea of equality in education. And the image on the right then is different and it touches a little bit on what some of you were commenting on. So in what ways do you think that this image, the second image represents a fairer opportunity than the first? Why is this more fair? Thank you to Jessica. People are given, individuals are given the tools that they need to succeed. More resources to aid every student. Thank you, Haley. Providing more for those who need it. Differences are taken into account and all are able to succeed. Very nice. So this is an example or a representation of the word that some of you are bringing up, equity, right? Equity is, yep, Hallie's got it, based on what individuals need. Equity in education means that students receive the instruction and support that is tailored to their individual needs. It's not a one size fits all. Um, and that's where we say fair is not equal. Um, and fair does not mean that students all get the same thing. And if we're going to truly educate all students, the foundation, the real foundation is equity, okay? Making sure that we provide students the resources and supports that they individually need. But now we're gonna take it a step further. So let's look at this third image. How does this differ, do you think, in representing fairness relative to the other two images? Thank you to Hallie, the barrier is gone. Anyone else wanna to add to that? Yeah, instead of accommodating the barrier, they took it away. Opens the opportunity to more people and different learners. Beautiful connections. So this image represents the concept of accessibility and really it's the next step. We know that we cannot eliminate all barriers. We don't have the ability to go back, you know, into things that are happening in the community, in the home and, and take care of everything that could be creating a barrier. But we do have the opportunity when we are preparing instruction and creating our classrooms and creating our schools to eliminate many of the 
barriers that prevent students from being successful in school. And that is what we want to focus on a bit today. So this idea of accessibility that really pushes beyond equity. So, so we want to give you a second to read this short cartoon and give you a second to think about what's going on in the image and what stands out to you. So what we hope you're seeing, yes, great. Here come some comments. That is exactly right, Jessica. It is the most accessible for all. Uh, and that's really this idea of accessibility is at least when what we can control as teachers, why are we not taking down those barriers? If I have control over it, why do I still hold up this barrier in front of my students? And that's the question we're asking ourselves now as educators is, why is the barrier even there? So we've talked about equity and fair isn't, you know, fair isn't equal for all and all those pieces. And we start to think, well, why did we put up the barrier in the first place? Uh, and we started to really think, where does the, one of the biggest barriers happen in school? The curriculum, right? What we do day to day, what we teach, what we're given to teach, why are there barriers there? When I could eliminate a lot of those barriers. Uh, good, I see some prioritizing the needs of the majority over the individual, right? If we shovel the ramp for everybody, everybody gets to go. Versus if I just shovel the ramp or the stairs, excuse me, then only some get to go. So why am I doing also this other piece of why am I doing more work when I could be planning universally and actually doing less over time because I'm already thinking about everyone. And so this this topic, the formal name for this in education is universal design for learning. And that's what we're gonna dig into a bit more today. So universal design for learning is based on brain science. This is one of the most exciting things I think about it for, for me uh, is really getting down into the nitty gritty of how students, how individuals actually learn. Uh, and so based on brain science, and this is all based on neuro scans and studies over many years, uh, we are looking at there are three big key areas in the way people learn. They learn through either recognition networks, strategic networks, or effective networks. And what does that mean, right? What does that mean in education terms? It's really the what of learning, the how of learning, and the why of learning. That's the three big questions everyone's brains kind of come to a problem with or come to an, a learning experience with is they want to know what, they want to know how, and they want to know why. Because how many times have you asked the why question or the when will I ever need this again? That's the why question, right? Uh, and so really it's causing us now to think and plan our curriculum so that we're answer, helping students answer those questions and not just leaving these things infamously hanging out there or uh, because the state tells you you have to learn that. There needs to be a stronger reason for that. And we can do that as teachers and give students that foundation that they need to learn any of the content when we think through this framework of the what, the how, and the why of learning. So the way that we do that then, we address the what aspect by providing multiple means of representation for students. And in, in a nutshell, what that means is that we don't just give them information in one way or one format. We give them information in a variety of modalities by speaking, um, by letting them read, by letting them engage with hands-on activities, video, all kinds of things. We want to represent content in a number of ways in terms of helping them get that what, the information that they're expected to learn. The way that we address the how of learning is giving them multiple means of expression and action. And that means that we let them identify a variety of ways to show us what they know. So we don't always expect students to speak their answers or to write their answers. Sometimes they're demonstrating things or using creative means for, um, for demonstrating their knowledge. We have to get past that idea that the only way to have students demonstrate knowledge is to take some kind of written test. 
we know that is not the only way and it's certainly not the most engaging way. It's necessary sometimes, um, but if we are being the most accessible teachers that we can, we're going to look for and create lessons that provide multiple means of action and expression. And finally, we need our students to know why they're learning and we need to be purposeful and intentional in engaging them. So we always need to plan lessons and instruction to stimulate their interests, to connect to things that they are familiar with and let them know the real purpose. When are you going to actually use this content? As Dr. Good shared, I'm sure many of you have had that experience where you're sitting in a class, especially in high school and you're thinking, why am I doing this? I am never actually going to use this skill. And if you don't know the purpose, then you are far less likely to attend to it, to be engaged in it, and then to actually learn it and acquire the skill. So these are the three areas that we focus on in universal design for learning. So give you a second to read the cartoon. This is really kind of UDL in a nutshell. Uh, when you really think about it, uh, and we're really thinking about when we're looking at allowing students to express themselves, uh, this is the cartoon that always pops into my brain when I'm laying out my, even my syllabus here at UMW. This is a thought that pops into my brain with every assignment. Um, is, is this a fair selection for everybody? Is this a fair exam for everyone? Um, and if you look at this, the, the climb the tree, you can see the expressions on certain students' faces. Some are <laughs> celebrating because that is their preferred medium of expression and that, that's their strong suit. And you have some that they're just like, I can never do this and they're terrified. Uh, and so that's one of the things that I try to think about. And I know Do uh, Dr. Jenkins does as well of thinking about how are we setting up our syllabus? How are we laying out our assignments? Uh, you take one of my courses, I can guarantee you, uh, you will have an opportunity to participate in an assignment that looks something like this, that gives you this idea of, I can express myself in the way that makes sense for me. Uh, so you might produce a video for me, or you might write a paper, or you might make a poster or a scrapbook that represents your knowledge or something of your choice. Um, because we can't be uh, afraid as teachers either to say the, you pick. And let's have a conversation about what that looks like for evaluation. Uh, and so that's the exciting part about UDL is because you actually get to see how students think. Uh, and that, that's what I love about UDL is I get to see how you think, not just can you produce information, can you regurgitate things that you've read. I want to know how are you processing that information. And that's one of the cool things about UDL is that it lets us think through that framework and provide opportunities to show uh, or allow students to show us how they think. Uh, and really that gives power to the curriculum, that gives power to knowledge, and that gives power to allow students to carry that knowledge forward, rather than it be sitting in isolation and then goes away. Um, UDL framework really says, let's help students hold on to this knowledge and bring it forward. Absolutely. And Dr. Good touched on something that I think is important, not just um, in terms of you as future teachers and the idea that if you are in the College of Education, we are preparing you to be future teachers, but that we as professors of education really try to uphold the beliefs and demonstrate the beliefs and values and practices that we're teaching you. So in our College of Education courses, you're going to see this idea of engagement across all of our professors. You're going to see the ideas related to differentiation and accessibility, and you're going to hear the term equity so often because it is really foundational in our thinking about preparing you to become future educators. So that's just a little um, heads up of what's coming ahead for those of you who choose, who choose to join us. We certainly hope that you have that experience ahead. So we are going to wrap the instructional part or the lecture part of our, of our activity by asking you to show what you know on a Jamboard. And I'll open the Jamboard here and show it to you in just a minute. But basically what you're gonna do is write a sticky note to share something that you now understand about education for all or universal design for learning. I'm gonna stop sharing this screen right here 
And first of all, I will post. There's the Jamboard link. So if you want to open that in the background somewhere. There we go. I see you all starting to join in. And I'm going to share my screen. Okay, can you all see my Jamboard screen and not the PowerPoint? Is that what you're looking at right now? Okay, I always like to make sure that I'm sharing the right screen. All right, so along this toolbar, we have a number of tools, but right here, this is a sticky note. So I'd like each of you to pick up a sticky note. It's gonna look something like that. You can change the colors if you wanna get fancy. And just type something that you now understand related to universal design for learning, equity, equality, accessibility, education for all. Just share something that you will take away from this discussion we've had today. There we go. Barriers cannot always be broken, yeah. But we can work on it. Students learn in different ways, cater to everyone's needs, very nice. Accessibility and not just equity is important, beautiful. No one size fits all, you are right. Everyone learns differently. It, you know, isn't that the core of this whole concept? We all learn differently. We all have different backgrounds and experiences. It's easier. I love that one. Did you see that? It's easier in the long one to consider everyone. <laughs> that's, that's a great one. <laughs> also seeing things like un eliminate unnecessary obstacles. Students learn in different ways. Really nice, everyone, really nice. Okay, so you have had a little hint of what a pretty typical instructional session looks like. Um, this is what our virtual instruction often looks like right now. We are excited to be planning for in-person instruction in the fall. Um, we have had a lot of positive experiences with the virtual. I will say, uh, I certainly feel connected and engaged with students in more ways than I ever thought we would when this whole crazy thing happened. Um, but we are so excited to have you back on campus and in person in the fall, and we are planning for that. I'm wondering, we have a few minutes left. Um, if there are any specific questions you have for Dr. Good or I, either about um, the content that we presented today, what instruction looks like in the College of Education, or just general questions about our College of Education programs that I can answer for you. No questions. Here's one. Do we have to double major in both education and the subject we want to teach, or can we just major in our given subject? So if you, Peyton, if you are looking at secondary education, you will likely major in um, both. You will have that degree that touches on the um, secondary skill that or the secondary content area that you're focused on and then your education content will be woven in let me um let me share the hang on one second the college of education page that has all of the um program offerings okay so there's that um 
Caroline, does the College of, Op of Education offer study abroad opportunities? We don't specifically within College of Education or education specific courses, but we certainly have COE students who engage in study abroad opportunities related to the other aspects of their program. So yes, you can do study abroad while also being in the College of Education. Um, Claire, how do teachers for tomorrow credits transfer? I'm going to refer you to Dr. Brett for that one and you will actually see her um, contact information on the bottom of that education.umw.edu page. So she is the best one to help you answer that because it varies based on where you earned your teachers for tomorrow credits. Um, Ella, when do you begin student teaching or getting experience in the classroom? You will actually have your first practicum placement in the, is it sophomore year, Dr. Good? I believe it roughly equates to your sophomore year. Yes, yep, I think it is. I want to say it's the first semester of your sophomore year, but it could be the second. And that will be in um, diversity and uh, language learning experiences. So yes, very early you get in and then by the time you get to the end of your program, you will have a full-time student teaching or internship placement. So lots of opportunities for being in classrooms are embedded throughout our program. In fact, we have more um, of those opportunities than a lot of programs across the state. Um, I want to be an art teacher in elementary would I go on just a, a, on a different track than just elementary education? So Samantha, I would say, again, you'll wanna to talk to, your, to an advisor. Dr. Brecht is usually the best contact. And as I said, her information is at the bottom. I think what would happen is that you would do the elementary major and then you could have art um, as your elective credits embedded in there to support that. And we have some thank yous from everybody. Any other questions that we can address for you right now? You are all very welcome. We're excited to see you in the fall. Absolutely. So feel free to reach out to um, Dr. Brecht, as I said, is your best contact. I'm going to type my email into the chat box. I'm happy to answer questions specific to today or specific to special education that I certainly have a bit more knowledge about that program or our coursework there. All right, thank you guys so much. Uh, I just wanna say if you guys are interested in participating in our administration panel Q&A, that's a CCPD, Campus Police, Res Life, Diversity and Inclusion, Academic Services and Student Life. That's gonna be from 12 to one. And I am dropping the link to that into the chat. Again, thank you guys so much for joining us today and you have a great rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.